Hello and welcome to this week's edition of LCAT News. I'm your host, Jen Carlos. First up, graduation. On Friday evening, the East Long Meadow High School class of 2018 gathered for the last time to be awarded diplomas, the 58th graduating class since the doors to the building opened in 1960. 218 seniors celebrated the end of their journey in the East Longmeadow Public Schools and will now move on to new challenges in the fall. You can watch the full graduation ceremony on LCAT. With the school year coming to an end, there are lots of events happening around the district. In recent years, students at Mapleshade have undertaken a comprehensive study of immigration during the early part of the 20th century, culminating in an immigration simulation, a day of engaging activities that transform the school into the Ellis Island of yesteryear. Here's a TV commercial promoting the event for parents and families, produced by students in Mr. Wiedersheim's class. Families and friends, did you know what we are studying in history of immigration? We've been researching countries, people, and Ellis Island. We are creating the rest of our story, studying text, pictures, and personal accounts. Join us on Tuesday, June 12th at 9 o'clock a.m. to share our experience with you. Did you know that we were studying the history of immigration? We've been working really hard. Most of us already know our characters' names, pictures, videos, and personal accounts. We want to invite you to join us on Tuesday, June 12th at 9 a.m. to share our experience with you. We've been working really hard. Most of us already know our characters' names and where we are coming from. We are creating the rest of our stories by studying text, pictures, videos, and other personal accounts. We want to invite you on Tuesday, June 12th at 9 a.m. to share our experiences with you. Come join us for Maple Shade 4th Grade Immigration Simulation on Tuesday, June 12th. See you at Ellis Island! On Sunday, May 27th, parishioners from five of the town's congregations gathered for an ecumenical dedication and blessing of the new Rainbow Community Garden in town, part of a new anti-hunger initiative from St. Mark's Episcopal Church and other partners that seeks to create a place where new life and nourishing food can thrive. We will bless the garden now. Pastor Enoch will begin. The garden will have a grounds attendant available on Saturdays from 9 a.m. to noon, Sundays from 3 to 6 p.m., and on Wednesdays from 4 to 7 p.m. The garden will be accessible from sunrise to sunset every day, but an attendant will only be available during the specified hours. A portion of all the food that is planted will be donated to the Open Pantry of Western Massachusetts, and all crops will be organic and chemical free. For more information, visit the St. Mark's website at stmarksma.org. Last week's discussion by the school committee of proposed changes to the high school dress code prompted some reaction by members of the ELHS student body. I talked with some students on Thursday and asked them what they'd like to say to the school committee and what they expect when the committee votes on June 18th to either adopt or reject the proposed changes. Well, I don't see why, like, if the dress code, like, from my personal experience, hasn't even been enforced for me, and I'm someone who, like, regularly breaks the fingertip rule or the, like, the crop top or the strap rule, so it's like, if it's not even being enforced, why have it? I'm dressing for my comfort, not the comfort of somebody else. And it's like, it's catered towards really the, like, the whole not distracting, like, boy students. Like, they just take it in a different way. Like, for girls, they're like, oh, like, you can't wear that because you're going to distract boys. Like, it intrudes on our education because it's like, you know, if we, like, 
the whole stigma around it. Like when some teachers enforce it, they're like, oh, like you can't wear that because you're distracting guys. But it's like, we're all here for the same purpose of learning. So if we're being expected to act like adults from administration, from like the school committee and whatnot, we should be able to make our own decisions as the adults that we are expected to be. I think I would have touched upon the fact that, yes, I do understand that they're saying hats are kind of a disrespectful thing to wear inside public situations. I do believe places like church and synagogues, you should not be wearing a hat unless it's religious reasons. But in a place where we're so informally dressed, where I'm walking around in neon shorts that don't even match my shirt, and I don't understand why wearing a hat would be so negatively thought upon in that situation. I do understand where if your your hat can shield your face from the security cameras, but if you're wearing a like a pon-pon hat, I don't really know what to call them, where there's a little ball up top and it's a winter hat and it's freezing in the school because the school gets very cold. I don't see how that prevents you from being seen from the security cameras and therefore what's the big deal about it. So it's an issue that they're spending too much time on and issues that actually really matter to students just get kind of brushed aside and they spend what seemed like, what, 52 minutes in that meeting. And the issue that Sam and I both were there to argue on, and so was Jenny, class rank was done in like four minutes. I think the issue of hats, I think it was mistreated in terms of is the policy unenforceable? And the answer is pretty resoundingly no. What you see is some teachers, yeah, they're not encouraged to send uh, first-time offenders down to the office. And that's the only point at which... Uh, any sort of record of wearing a hat would appear on somebody's disciplinary record. So what happens is uh, teachers deal with multiple offenders in the class, and by the point that they do get sent down to the office, then the administration says, oh, this is the first time they've been reported for this type of thing. So what ends up happening is uh, people that wear hats, they're never really disciplined, so the policy is enforceable. And in terms of wasting time in class, the same issue arises where if they know that administration isn't really going to act on it, as I formerly mentioned, they really can't, given their current layout of, okay, this is the first time that they've been sent to the office for this type of thing, people think that the battle of, over the hat ends in the classroom, and that's where you do spend 20 minutes debating over whether or not it's okay to wear a hat. It's the first time this has occurred, and they're going to send you back. The dress code, in every other sense, and the hat issue are two very separate things. So to tie them together at all, to say, if you want this, then you have to have this, that's treating it badly, because the dress code as we have it is sexist. And the hat issue is something that's completely irrelevant to that. So the issue of saying, are we going to pass the dress code? And kind of tying in hats with it as almost a political tool to getting it pushed through, that does seem a little, uh, <laughs> it does seem wrong. So I think that we should treat them as two completely independent issues. I think the issue of um, the mental health issues that t uh, teenagers specifically face is an issue that the school committee has not taken seriously for a very long time and it was like it was pretty evident to most of the student body who went to the town hall meeting that was held by the high school administration when one of the school committee members suggested that saying hello to someone or giving someone a wave would help them in their issues of mental health which is just a ridiculous victim blaming and tone deaf thing to assume. So I think if they spent more time in research on issues like that, um, other than dress code, it would be far more effective to students. And also, this goes back to the dress code, is a concern of the school committee was the hats and the threat it poses to um, security cameras and how it would be hard to identify someone. But in many, if not all, of the cases of um, where there's been like active shooter threats at schools, the individual has always had some uh, mental health issue, and maybe if the school system or not not even the school system individually, but the community as a whole were more um, outreaching towards individuals that have mental health or mental illnesses, it could have prevented or helped some of those individuals that um, were. Uh, uh, that committed those crimes. Um, and not to say that those, the people who committed those crimes are not criminals, they are, but it, in, it, it might be more um, reasonable or, or safe in the interest of security to look into the mental health issue and how that, how, you know, um, aiding in that regard could 
help the, the security and the safety of the schools in general. So. And after several complaints from East Longmeadow residents in regard to speeding in one particular section of town, Maple Shade Avenue, we bring you an important message on speed limits. Maple Shade Avenue has been the topic of several social media complaints from town residents after multiple vehicles there have been spotted driving far over the posted speed limit. School zone speeds are set at 20 miles per hour in Massachusetts, yet many cars exceed 35 miles an hour, something East Longmeadow Police Chief Jeffrey D'Alessio asserts is unsafe. Drivers tend to speed up during the summer months, according to D'Alessio, but with so many children in town, speeding brings even more danger. With Birchland Park Middle School and Mapleshade Elementary students both traveling home on this road, it's important to remember to keep under the speed limit, pay close attention to the speedometer, and leave earlier so you don't rush to your destination. If residents keep these tips in mind, we can help to make East Longmeadow an even safer, more pleasant place to be. Here's what's happening this upcoming week at the East Longmeadow Library. On Monday, June 4th at 6 p.m. is A Life of Sorrow. Performed by the award-winning actor and musician Gary Reed, A Life of Sorrow, The Life and Times of Carter Stanley is about a mountain music legend. This performance affords today's audiences a chance to connect with a bluegrass treasure as he tells the story of his life in old-time mountain music. Sponsored by the Friends, registration is required. And on Thursday, June 7th from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. is mini computer classes. Using the library computers, receive hands-on training from an ELPL librarian. Each week will focus on a different topic. Space is limited, registration is required. Call 525-5400, extension 1508. We leave you now with a look at this Saturday's Edible Plant Walk at Heritage Park. This event was guided by Rich Giordano, the former manager of Old Sturbridge Village Historic Herb Gardens and the current manager of All Hill Farm in West Brookfield. Um, so in the, in the woods proper, a lot of the food plants are more ephemeral spring things like ramp that only get the light in the spring. On the edge of the forest, you know, where you go from field to wood is usually a really great place, an edge habitat. Um, you ever have pink lemonade? Pink lemonade? <laughs> <laughs> you cut the head off, stick it in water, swirl it around, that ascorbic acid will come off, it turns the water pink, oddly enough. Pour it through a strainer to get the little buggies and stuff out. If you add a little bit of sugar, it's just pink lemonade. That was awesome. Pardon? It's sumac. It's sumac. sumac. Well, smooth and staghorn will both work. But this is uh, staghorn sumac, it's got the fuzz on it. Um, the other thing that this is kind of neat for, if anybody here cats maple trees, Back in the day, uh, this would actually make a really nice, what they call a spile. You know, if you're a maple tree and we're going to tap you, you drill the hole and you need a tube that you put in. The, the pith on this, once you get to this kind of wood, the pith, the heartwood, is like styrofoam. And you can take a, a wire and just stuff it through and you'll have a tube. Actually, when I was, when I was a kid, we actually would make um, uh, flutes out of them sometimes, but they're really sticky and they get thick all the <laughs> But you could hollow that out, stick it in the tree, and that was the spile, the tap for the tap and maple tree. Too. And if you take acorn, generally white oak have lower tannin than red oak, generally. But white oak are what we would look for. You peel them, crush them, put them in the pantyhose, and throw it in the stream. And tannin is water soluble. The water leaches the tannin out, and now you have this like, almost like a uncooked um, hash brown kind of thing that you can make little patties with and fry up. And it's actually really nutritious and free. Acorns are all over the place. This is a mulberry, which will also have ovate, eight, single lobe, and double lobe. It's the only two trees I know of around here that do that. So this is actually a Morris album, white mulberry. And if you see the fruit right there, yeah, guess what color it's going to be if it's a Morris album. White. Wouldn't that make sense? You would think so. Yeah, they're not. Okay. Almost never. Um, this is going to end up being uh, usually like a dark purpley, but very, 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 very sweet. Um, to the point that they're almost not yummy to eat fresh off the tree, but if you dry them, they're really, really nice. And you can get cultivated varieties of these that are phenomenal. Um, but that's kind of cool. Like, around here, I didn't expect to see something like this. Um, in New York City, they're actually one of the most common weed trees there are. You know. 30 something years ago I worked at the Bronx Zoo and it's amazing how many people would yell at me to not eat those things because they're deadly poison and every other tree in the Bronx Zoo is a mulberry tree and, and the reason why they're here which is actually kind of slick if you didn't know this you guys know about um, silkworms right mm -hmm. silkworms eat mm -hmm. mulberry. mulberry all right in the 1830s they established a silkworm industry in central Massachusetts if you go to North Brookfield the next town from where I live there's a silkworm mill that's still standing and what ended up happening was it tanked. It didn't work very well because um, they weren't quite as hardy as they thought, but they imported 
the, the Morris Alba, the white mulberry from Asia, as opposed to our Morris Negra, the black mulberry, which is an indigenous one, which will get as big as an oak tree. Kind of hard to pick those for your, for your you know, silkworm. But what ended up happening was when the silkworm industry tanked, they brought in a replacement. And the replacement was uh, the gypsy moth butterfly. Oh, no. They brought those in, and I think it was in Menden. Someone brought in a couple hundred of them to try and work with them as a replacement to keep the silkworm industry going. They got loose, and now the things are just decimating the state. That's it for this week's edition of LCAT News. I'm your host, Jen Carlos. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. <laughs>